Well, hello and welcome to this edition of My Two Cents Worth. This is the part of the channel where I give you my two cents worth about a particular topic. And before we get any further, hit that subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it pops up so you can be notified whenever content is added to the channel and comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. And if you've been on online more than five minutes, you know all that. And this particular edition of My Two Cents Worth is brought to you by A Closer Walk with Jesus, a book that I wrote, 21st Century Christian published it. The most important decision you are going to make ever is to be whether or not to be baptized into Christ, whether or not to become a Christian. That's more important than what college you go to, what career field you go into, and even more important than who you're going to marry. And at the beginning of our walk with Jesus, we uh, have have a sort of a learning curve. There, there are things that we need to know as part of the family of God that we are responsible for as we set a path of spiritual growth. And this is what I wrote this book for, is to help people with that idea. It's great for ind individual study. If you have a small group that meets uh, at the house uh, Monday nights or something like that, or meets at the coffee shop for study, this would be a good study aid if for your Sunday school or Wednesday night classes, it would be a great one, a great uh, uh, book for that. And then you can get it by going to uh, 21stcc.com, that's 21st Century Christian's website, or you may drop in at the store if you like. I still like to drop in every once in a while and say hi. You might even find a book that I've autographed. Uh, no, they don't give you a discount for the autograph book, sorry. Uh, 4108 Hillsborough Pike Suite 200 in Nashville, Tennessee. Customer service hours are uh, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. That is when the phone lines are open. You can get help that way. Uh, the store itself is open 830 to 430 Monday through Thursdays and then 830 to 4 on Friday Central Time. They are closed uh, weekends and the major holidays. You can also give them a call at 615-383-3842 if you are in Middle Tennessee the fax number, 615-292-5983. Uh, Outside of Middle Tennessee, 800-251-2477. And then, of course, uh, there's Amazon.com for all you 21st century uh, savvy, tech savvy, internet savvy, which I assume you are because um, you wouldn't be watching this video if you weren't uh, on online. And then if you've got a, a, a local neighborhood, uh, maybe one of those regional bookstores that's just in one or two states, help your local economy. Give them the chance to earn your business and order uh, my book or whatever other materials you need through them. Help them out. It'd be great for your local economy. Okay. I was going to call this uh, Don't Believe the Meme. I do those every once in a while where I get some... A uh, meme that comes across my news feed, and I take it apart and and show you where all the error is. But I just decided to call this progressive Christianity debunked again, and uh, this is why. This meme, uh, I think I saw it in one of my social media groups. It might have cleared my news feed, but according to this, the religious right gets Jesus wrong. We are supposed to welcome undocumented immigrants, embrace our LGBTQIA plus siblings, tax the rich, share the wealth, advocate for the oppressed, and beat our guns into plowshares. It's biblical. So says Reverend Dr. Caleb J. Lines. Now, he is the senior guy out at in San Diego at the University uh, Christian Church, and they are a Disciples of Christ. Now, from a strictly secular historical standpoint, there is a connection between the churches of Christ and the disciples of Christ and the independent Christian churches. Now, me, myself, I do not consider myself a part of any man-made denomination. A lot of people who meet in buildings with the name Church of Christ on them, they'll, they used to. They don't do it so much anymore. Talk a lot about Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, uh, Ben Franklin, not that Ben Franklin uh, that you're thinking of, but this Ben Franklin is related to him. I think he's like a grand nephew or something like that. Great, great nephew, something like that. But they would talk about Alexander Campbell with the impression that he started the churches of Christ. Really, the churches of Christ go back to Acts chapter 2. We use the name Church of Christ. There is no official name for the church. We just use a name that's biblical you know, we own buildings, we've got websites now, phone books, phone ads, and that sort of thing. you got to put a name on it, so we use a biblical name. 
So anyway, I said all that to say this, that uh, uh, Mr. Lines here is part of the uh, Christian Church or Disciples of Christ, which if you put all three of us on a spectrum, they would be out at the left. And they tend to be more liberal about just about everything. They do ordain women, uh, and it's not just some of the things uh, like instrumental music and women's ordination that separate us. There's a whole lot more, and we're going to get into some of that uh, here in this video. And then the Churches of Christ, we tend to be out on the right. We're more conservative than the disciples. And somewhere in the middle is your standard independent Christian church. And they are going to run the gamut. Um, some of them, like the one I went to in high school, I was, you know, kind of interested in this girl, which is what got me going to church. But that's another, another story for another time. From the best of my recollection, the only significant difference between that independent Christian church and the uh, Churches of Christ was the instrumental music. They did a Christmas and Easter program, which a lot of churches of Christ do now. Some have abandoned all that in the in, across the board. A lot of churches have given those up. But that would just kind of give you an idea that we do have a sort of common heritage, sort of uh, from a secular history, popular nomenclature kind of viewpoint. Okay, now, getting back to his meme, when he says the religious right gets Jesus wrong, I consider myself... I don't like titles like that, okay, because what I consider to be the religious right, you may consider to be liberal, believe it or not. Uh, there are some members in our fellowship in the Churches of Christ that thought that one of the churches I went to was liberal because they supported a Bible school out of the treasury, and then I had someone else tell me just how over-the-top conservative that same church was. So remember, the, a lot of these terms are subjective, but... Um, I do consider myself conservative, right of center, and just about uh, everything politically, philosophically, uh, religiously, I do consider myself to the right. But for folks like uh, Mr. Lines, when they say we get Jesus wrong, my question is, how do you know? Because they reject so much of the Bible. The religious left rejects the Bible as the inspired word of God. You've got people on the religious left that don't think Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. The old Jesus seminar, which no longer exists, thankfully, uh, didn't think that John, anything in the Gospel of John was authentic, except for chapter 4, verse 44, which is uh, the writer attributing a statement to Jesus. It's not actually anything Jesus said, that a prophet is not without honor in his own country. And he's essentially quoting Jesus. Or, or saying, you know, Jesus said, he, and it's not in red inks, okay? He's just kind of saying, hey, yeah, Jesus one time said this. The rest of it they don't think is authentic. Uh, John Shelby Spong has said Jesus didn't preach the Sermon on the Mount. So when you strip it all away, then how do you know I'm getting Jesus wrong or anybody on the right is getting Jesus wrong if you reject the Bible? Because we don't have any other record about what Jesus said and did. Uh, Mr. Lyons has said, don't make the Bible an idol. I'm honestly not real sure what that means, but I'm going to play a clip here in just a minute that might give us a hint as to what he means, because he doesn't, again, he does not believe the Bible, uh, or at least uh, he believes the parts, I think, that he likes. But when it comes to the inspiration, here's what he has to say. Let's roll the clip. This Lent, we're giving up bad theology. Today, we're giving up the idea that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. One thing we talk a lot about within progressive Christianity is how we should take the Bible seriously, but not always literally. If we always take the Bible literally, we run into all kinds of problems and contradictions because we're reading it in a way that it was never intended to be read. The ancients understood the difference between truth and fact, that something can be true without actually happening. We need to understand that difference as well. If we don't, then we might be tempted to read through a story like the creation story and think that God literally created the universe in seven days instead of hearing the truth that God has always been present and at work in our world. When we read through the Bible, we should hear the stories of people who are searching for God and for truth because that's how they were intended to be read. Take the Bible seriously, but not always literally. Now, the Bible is literature, like a novel or something like that in that sense. Now, no, I'm not saying the Bible's a novel, okay? I'm just saying it's literature. A novel's a form of literature. Biography's a form of literature. 
And unless there's a compelling reason to not take a statement in the scriptures literally, it should be taken literally. Now, there is figurative language that gets used. Jesus said, I am the door. Well, he's not literally a door like I've got over here to come into this room. Uh, I am the shepherd. Well, he's sort of a shepherd there because we are like sheep. He compares us to sheep. We are not literal sheep. Uh, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, figuratively, we take the body and blood in the juice and in the, uh, the bread uh, every week. So there is figurative language in the scriptures. But when it comes to things like Genesis 1, and that statement that he makes about God has always been in the world. Okay, yeah, I don't so much have a problem with that, but that doesn't address the issue of, of where did the world come from? Evolution can't answer that. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the billion years uh, of, of that atheism says that the universe has been here, they need it to be able to fit all their evolutionary changes in. And then you got some dogmatic young earth creationists. Oh, the earth is only 6,000 years old. I'm kind of in the middle. I lean young earth. But I believe that Genesis 1 and, and 2 is the uh, account of creation with a, a recap in, in chapter 2. I believe God created it just like it says. Okay, so yes, I take the Bible seriously, and unless there's a compelling reason with a particular passage, I'll take it literally. There's no reason to think that Genesis 1-1 is anything other than a record of what God did. Okay, and then you've got, uh, you know, along the same lines with uh, progressive Christianity, the Bible is not the Word of God in any literal or verbal sense, never has been. The late great John Shelby Spong said that. Now, he passed away a few years ago. He was 90, had a stroke, and he had some of the health issues that 90-year-olds have. I hope he repented. I don't know if he did. It's between him and God now, everything that he taught and believed. But I believe he was a shipwrecker of the faith, now, just like pretty much all progressive Christians are. And then there was this. This person, I, I get uh, n some newsletters and things from various progressive uh, uh, groups, websites, what have you. And then there was this. This was a question sent to uh, one of the newsletters where this person, Cheryl, says, I feel very confused about letting go of what I believed, that I'm a sinner, and unless I believe in a fundamentalist style religion, well, who knows what will happen. I stopped going to church quite some time ago and have always had a difficult time fitting into organized religion. However, now because everything has become so confusing with progressives, fundamentalists, etc., I find having to just let go altogether doesn't sit right with me either. The good news in this is it looks like all this is bothering her, so she is still searching. That, that's what I think is happening here. She's still searching. She's got some questions. Now, she just came from a fundamentalist background. That's all I know. I don't know what kinds of questions, uh, specific questions she has or what kind of answers she's been getting. Because I have found over the years, at least in my early days as a Christian, there were a lot of answers given that, quite frankly, were pretty lame. And there were, there was a couple that I knew, very dear couple, they're both passed on now, that they rejected a lot of science. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, if they thought anything rejected with, uh, or, or contradicted or was not mentioned in the Word of God. Let me give you the real example of, with this couple. I had a, a uh, relative who died very suddenly of a heart attack. Wasn't that old. He was in his, I think, late 50s. And when they went to prepare him for burial, I remember the undertaker saying how large the blood clots were that he had because he did not eat a good diet. He didn't take care of himself was a heavy smoker for years and that kind of thing. Well, I kind of put the fear into me because heart disease runs in the family. And I said something to this couple about, it. I said, you know, I, just, I was in my late twenties at the time, quite a bit younger than I am now. And I thought, you know, I might just give up fried foods. Well, they laughed at me because, uh, you know, why, where, where in the Bible does it say that, you know, you need to stick with God. You won't go wrong. Then the Bible doesn't say anything about fried foods. Okay, that was his mistake, was every little thing looking into the Bible that, you know, we need to thus say it the Lord or, we, or, or it's not true. Okay, now those are the kind of people that the media would like love to get a hold of and uh, do a 30 or 40 minute interview with them and then take out a two minute soundbite to make them look stupid and to make all Christians look stupid. 
Okay, they would not consider some things. Now, real science and scripture do not conflict. Okay, well, what about evolution? Yeah, what about it? I consider it a philosophy. It's one explanation about how the earth and the world came into existence, but because it gets taught as the only explanation, nothing else gets considered, which to me says it's more propaganda than anything else. But here's the answer from the Reverend Jim Bur Burklow. Uh, he tells Cheryl, and this is May 24th, this, or 2024, so this is just uh, about a month ago. He says, you don't have to believe anything in order to follow Jesus' way of compassion. You don't have to believe in the Bible, whatever that means. So it gives you an idea. And I believe he's the one that refers to the Bible as a sacred myth. Uh, you don't have to repeat a list of dogmatic statements in order to be part of a progressive Christian community. Are you willing to do what Jesus did and love even your enemies? That's plenty challenging. And it's all that progressive Christianity asks of you. So my question then is exactly what does it mean to love my enemy or love my friends? Uh, I guess someone comes in in blatant sin. Yeah, homosexuality. Which, what am I supposed to do there? The Bible says it's a sin. I'm going to get to that here in just a minute. He says, I think it might help you to understand that progressive Christianity is categorically different than evangelical or fundamentalist Christianity. Progressive Christianity isn't about you being a Christian. It does not draw a circle around itself to define who is a Christian and who is not. Well, then what's it about if it's not about being a Christian? Why call yourself a Christian? Progressive Christianity has no walls, but rather it has an attractive center point, the unconditional divine love that Jesus practiced and preached. Wait a minute, if he was just another guy wandering around, how can he be divine? We take the Bible seriously because we don't take it literally. I would challenge that. I don't think they do take it seriously. We employ its rich treasure of myth and poetry. So right there, he's not taking it seriously. It's a myth to him and poetry. As a language to express our spiritual journeys, we value the rituals and traditions of our faith as practice that nature, uh, our ability, that nurture our ability to relate to the universe and to other people with awe and compassion. So he calls the Bible a myth and poetry, so he's not taking it seriously. And that tells me he doesn't believe it. So how can you call yourself a Christian if you don't believe the Bible? How can you say you're following Jesus if you're rejecting the record, the only record we have of him? And then kind of along the same lines, here's another one from Caleb Lines. God doesn't care what you believe. God cares how you behave. If he were in my class and I gave him uh, uh, the test and he gave me that answer, I'd probably give him a half a point. God does care about how we behave. I'm not going to argue that point. But does he care about our belief? Well, Jesus said God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, I'm assuming, of course, that what John said is accurate. They would probably not assume that. So I don't know if they would even take this uh, uh, as, as an argument. But Jesus says truth. So that would seem to imply that we've got to do it right. 1 Timothy 2. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So he wants all to be saved. Come to a knowledge of what? The truth. Come to a what of the truth? Knowledge. So it's something we can know. And truth has a definite article. It's singular. There's only one. And God wants all, desires it, which implies that not everybody is going to come to a, a be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth because we have this pesky little thing called free will. You've got to make your choices. I've got to make my choices. And then a few uh, chapters later, we skip over to chapter 4, and he says, Let no one despise your youth. Paul, talking to Timothy, Timothy's a young man um, trying to uh, get the church established uh, in Ephesus, and uh, he's having a rough go of it, apparently, because he's a young man. You got these old whippersnappers here, Sonny, what you mean telling me how I'm supposed to live? You know, it's like some of the uh, older people I've known who like to argue with doctors and nurses about stuff. But anyway, uh, he says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct. So there you go, in conduct. So he does care about how we behave. But in word, isn't that what I'm saying? 
or, and, and in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to what? Do doctrine, doctrine, let's see. You mean, Paul, that you do care about what we believe and what we're teaching? Because I'm supposed to give uh, attention to doctrine. He says, do not neglect the gift that is in you that was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of, of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress uh, be not or uh, may be made evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. There's that word doctrine again. I should have highlighted that one. Continue in them for in doing that you will save both yourself and those who hear. So doctrine is important. What we believe is important. Now, if you don't believe the Bible, it's going to be a tough sell to, to, to convince you of that. But you cannot be a Christian and reject the Bible. That is just a, a complete fallacy. And then he says we are supposed to welcome undocumented immigrants. Uh, uh, some of them now are being called migrants. So we used to call them illegal aliens because they're breaking the law. And that is actually right out of the one of the federal statutes, 8 United States Code 1365. So basically, progressive Christians encourage law-breaking. You know, the current occupant of the Oval Office, who basically threw the borders open, they're encouraging law-breaking. Our immigration system's broken. I keep hearing, I try to stay out of politics, but this might get a little political. I hear about this broken immigration system that we have, and my answer again is, how do you know? We have not consistently enforced the immigration laws in decades Ronald Reagan issued an amnesty to illegal aliens in the 1980s. I think it was like 2 million, between 2 and 3 million. And supposedly toward the end of his life, President Reagan said that was one of his biggest regrets was that uh, that uh, immigration reform because we got a lot of amnesty, but we didn't get the enforcement. And now I don't know how many. The, I, I don't think anybody really knows how many people are in this country illegally and some of them enter legally through ports of entry for study or whatever and then they overstay but see we are supposed to obey the law and the only exception is if the law uh, conflicts with what God says for us to do and when it comes to immigration having a system of who comes in and how many we let in, and under what circumstances, there is nothing in Scripture that dictates that. The Old Testament, the covenant with Israel has got some guidelines, but we don't have any. Yes, we should welcome and encourage legal aliens and immigrants. My mother's an immigrant. She came from Great Britain. Her mother came from Scotland. Oh, yeah, I guess both the UK. So whatever country you're from, whatever your nationality, whatever your religion, whatever your... Come one, come all. That's great. That's fine. But to uh, say that we need to give special dispensation to illegal immigrants, uh, that's wrong. We've got cities around uh, uh, that are uh, uh, giving special benefit housing to illegal immigrants, uh, but yet we got veterans and other homeless Americans that aren't getting the attention they need. Romans chapter 13 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So our government, whether you like it or not, whether it's Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Green Party, they are instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Well, do what is good, and you will have praise of the same. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with our government that way uh, right now. That's all I have to say about that. Verse 4, for he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. That is a first century euphemism for capital punishment. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Oh, did he have to mention that? Anyway, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to uh, all their due, taxes to whom taxes due, custom to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, you may not like the immigration laws. That's fine. That's why we have a legislative process to go through to change the laws. 
And there's nothing wrong with petitioning your congressman, your senator, or whoever to change the laws. We can do that. But breaking the laws, unless there is, you know, 100% clear cut, this violates God's law, then no, even if you don't like the law, you still, uh, God still expects you uh, to follow the law. We are not allowed to just disobey God laws just because we don't like them. So progressive Christians are encouraging law-breaking, and there's another aspect dealing with people entering the country uh, illegally, and that's medical. You know, we, we've got some problems going on now with various diseases that are making comebacks, and some that are uh, like COVID. We just got over COVID here a couple of years ago, and other diseases. So uh, are the people entering the country being vaccinated against those diseases? Well, yes and no. There are some laws on the book that when the person comes over and they're in, in, in say, being held in a refugee camp or something, they're probably not vaccinated. But if they're going to be uh, uh, let go into the population, they're supposed to be vaccinated. Let's put it that way. Now, Reverend David Felton is a progressive, progressive Christian. And uh, this was back in February of this year. He had uh, an interview with uh, evolutionary biologist, ecologist, Dr. Michael Zimmerman, founder and executive director of the Clergy Letter Project and the Religion and Science Weekend, formerly Evolution Weekend. Asked for some guidance marking the day. This was uh, Darwin's birthday. And here, here's uh, uh, Dr. Felton said this in his column uh, in a lead up to the interview. He said, to most of us, the latest survey results from Pew Research are no surprise that nuns, that is Americans claiming no religious affiliation, have risen to become the largest religious cohort in the country. At 28%, Catholics are 23%, Evangelical Protestants at 24%. Many of these unaffiliated point to the church's anti-science stance as one of the main reasons for their dissatisfaction. Now, I would I need to get their definition of church. Are they lumping all religions into this, or is he speaking of a particular religious group? Because no two religious groups are going to have the exact same answer on this. He said, nevertheless, fundamentalist Christians are doubling down in their continued effort to discredit science and advance their antediluvian worldview. That means the worldview before the flood. Uh, through state legislation and school board elections across the country. And while LGBTQ plus rights, race, and alternative history seem to be dominating their front page efforts, creationism and anti-evolution campaigns continue just under people's, most people's radar. And he says, Dr. Mike, uh, and this is here, he's having his uh, interview with Dr. Michael Zimmerman. And this is Zimmerman's first comment. He said, it's important because uh, religion is being, and that's, you know, Darwin and evolution, that sort of thing. It's important because religion is being redefined in the public sphere as being congruent with fundamentalism. Mainstream religion, religious views are just being tossed out. At the same time, science is under attack from those same fundamentalists. Okay, so he's saying those of us who believe the Bible, have that kind of worldview, are attacking science. We And just keep that in mind. We need to be able to show the general public that it is really important to look at the world and see it as it really is and not as others want it to be. Uh, there's, I could probably go 30 minutes on that sentence alone. Even though we're past the worst of the pandemic, COVID-19 is still the fourth leading cause of death in the country. And that's not insignificant. And yet the attack on science is being led, uh, is leading people rather not to be vaccinated. And now measles is on the return because people don't believe in vaccinations anymore. We look at the world and see that there's a global climate crisis. And yet there are people saying, well, the scientists can't be trusted about that either. It's all politics. So we need to bring the general population back to seeing how science can help make for a better world and how that's one and how that's one of the things religion is all about as well. Well, let's have a look at a couple of things. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control indicates measles cases already surpassed last year's numbers. This is from March 22nd of 2024. But notice this from the CDC report. It says right here that uh, one aggravating factor that I've got highlighted here in yellow, one aggravating factor is the admission of unvaccinated immigrants. What's that got to do with fundamentalist Christians and our views on vaccination? Because remember, he just said, Zimmerman just said, 
Science is under attack from those same fundamentalists. Mainstream religious views are just being tossed out at the same time science is under attack from those same fundamentalists. Yet we've got immigrants coming into the country who are not va properly vaccinated. Well, how is that our fault? You know, where's some of the conservatives that are saying, hey, let's control the immigration population. And then in Chicago, for example, over 33,000 immigrants arrived from, uh, from the Texas border thanks to a transportation effort by Governor Greg Abbott. Chicago hadn't reported a case of measles since 2019, but as of Friday, that would, I guess, would be the Friday before uh, this, uh, you know, this is March uh, of, um, of uh, 2024, the city had 17 cases. So from January 1st of 2024 to March 22nd, Chicago had 17 cases of measles. Prior to that, you'd have to go back to 2019. Okay, so what's going on with these immigrants that they're not vaccinated? Now, I do wish Governor Abbott would quit sending the immigrants to, uh, to uh, Illinois and that because so many of these blue states, they make it very easy to get ID and things when you are not uh, 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 in the country legally. They're one of the states that will give driver's license to people who are, excuse me, undocumented. But see, they're coming in here without vaccinations. And if we're not uh, checking to be sure that they've got them, then how can you say it's us fundamentalist Christians who are at fault for the rise in measles? Here's this little one, too. Also, uh, I think this is also, yeah, this is from the CDC. Almost all people in the U.S. with measles, watch this, either traveled internationally or were around someone who traveled internationally. Okay, so I go overseas, and if, if for whatever reason I don't get my shots, or somebody comes into the country who has not gotten their shots, how is that a fundamentalist Christian problem? And by the way, for the record, our daughter's got all her shots. We have all our shots. We even got the first COVID and the, and the, uh, the booster for it. We decided after that we weren't getting it anymore. But we're not anti-vaccine. In fact, I know very few Christians who are. In fact, I can only think of one family off the top of my head that I would put in the anti-vaccine category. Some of us are more non-vaccine. We just, I don't get a flu shot every year. Okay, you want to get a flu shot? Fine. I just don't do it. I've only had the flu, I think, twice in my life. But I remember when I was in Canada, had a doctor there. She said, when's the last time you had a T, 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 B, the tetanus diphtheria rebel, uh, 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 vaccination? That was in the late 90s. I said, whoa, I'd have to go back to the 70s. She said, why don't we get that booster? I said, okay, not a problem. Most Christians accept science, okay? It's when we get into the evolution that we have a problem. And with COVID-19, we had a lot of problems because of where it came from. How In the beginning, how serious was it? There was a lot of confusion, misinformation. Uh, I uh, even asked a doctor when they were coming up with the vaccine about it, and he just kind of rolled my eyes, didn't say anything. But I could tell by his sort of uh, facial expression, he wasn't sold on the vaccine either. And a couple of uh, pharmacist uh, assistants, when I asked them about it, they were afraid to say anything outright publicly, but you could tell by the looks they were giving me, they at least questioned it. Now, I thought science was all about asking questions. And why is it because the CDCs uh, uh, during all this time, why did we have to accept without questioning? I mean, if you don't believe that, fine, question it. Give me some other statistics. If you think this is from the CDC, wrong, fine, just, just show me something. Well, let's have the discussion. But they didn't want to have the discussion. Uh, it wasn't us fundamentalist Christians that were shutting it down. And as a result, a lot of people were, and I was one of them, was skeptical to take the, the COVID vaccine because it was being rushed to market so fast. And I'm saying, <laughs> all the other uh, 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 vaccines and drugs that we get typically take years to develop. You did this, you know, before lunchtime, uh, in a manner of speaking. So let's have the discussions. Let's ask questions. Welcome the questions. And I have lots of questions about this stuff. It's, it's not us Christians that are there. There are some conservative Christians who will uh, argue and fuss with science, like that, that, um, that couple I told you about earlier, but they're very few in number. They are not the ones that are causing problems. As far as the whole climate crisis goes, I am a skeptic of man-made climate change. I believe the climate can change, but I believe a lot of what we're seeing now in the name of climate science is politics. Uh, uh, and I'll have some more to say about what I think is politics coming up with some other things.
But when I see countries like China and India getting away with all their pollution and they want the rest of the Western world to basically come back to caveman uh, level of living, something's not right. When the only solutions put forth as valid are government solutions supported by taxes, uh, forgive me, but I'm going to be skeptical of that. Okay, moving on. We are supposed to embrace our LBGTQIA, you wait, whatever the alphabet soup is. Okay, no problem. I'll welcome anybody to church. As far as I'm concerned, everybody uh, should be welcome at church to come in, learn about the Lord, and worship the Lord. That's not the problem. The issue is, what do we do when a person comes in, I want to learn about Jesus, okay, now I want to become a Christian, but I want to continue in my sin. Now we got a problem. See, these are the scriptures that teach tell us that the LBGQ, the alphabet, is a sin. Matthew chapter 19 defines marriage. Jesus said, when a man leaves his uh, mother and father and cleaves to his wife, the two become one. He didn't say when a person leaves and cleaves. He didn't say when two men or two women. It's a man and a woman. There's your definition of marriage. Look after verse 12 at the follow-up discussion with the apostles eunuchs in that case speaking of figurative are uh, he's using eunuchs as a figurative teaching tool illustration to explain his teaching on marriage okay now i'm going to show you the definitive list of passages that say anything at all positive about homosexuality about lbgtqia plus i gotta say it slow because i always trip over it okay here's the definitive list where anything positive is said about any of that you ready there it is. There it is. All the scriptures that say anything positive about LBG, uh, the alphabet, mafia. See, but, and these passages tend to get overlooked. 1 John 3, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you, who, uh, and you know that he was manifest to take away our sin, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So sin is lawlessness. If you're not uh, living as the scriptures teach, and that, yeah, sure, love your neighbor and all that, but remember, we're also told to live righteously, holy, sanctified lives. If you're not doing that, then, then, then something's not right. On the road to uh, Emmaus, Jesus said, uh, Thus it was written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead a on the third day that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you have been endowed with power from on high. This is why Jesus came. Oh, I thought it was uh, to, to combat uh, uh, empire and colonialism, and that's why he went to the cross. No! He went to the cross to pay the price for your sins. Oh, well, my church doesn't teach the atonement. Then you're not in a Christian church. You're in a group of people meeting who do not understand the holiness and the righteousness of God. God is, is loving and merciful and gracious, but he's also uh, righteous. And his standard is way up here. We're way down here. We cannot meet it. That's why Jesus came. And if someone is saying denying the atonement, they're a false teacher. They are not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. And then this one, tax the rich, share the wealth. Where in the Bible is that? Where in history has, uh, has this ever succeeded? His next uh, claim, tax the rich, share the wealth. Where in the Bible is that taught? Where in history has that ever succeeded? And, and what is the desired outcome of taxing the rich? I've always wondered that. If you are able to take the Warren Buffetts, the Bill Gateses, and all that, and reduce them down to middle class or poverty, then where are you going to get the money to finance all the stuff that you want to provide f free? 
Now, nowhere in Scripture is being wealthy called a sin. There are cautions given to the wealthy. There are warnings. James chapter 2, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who uh, inherit the kingdom, he promised to those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? And they not the ones who are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Then in Exodus, here's an interesting thing. We always talk about taxing the rich more, you know, when, but when I go to the grocery store and I buy a gallon of milk, if the gallon of milk is say $4, that's the price. It doesn't say, well, if your income is more than $50,000, it's $4. If you're over a hundred thousand, then it's $5. It's one price. So why shouldn't taxes be the same? That's another discussion for another time. Exodus chapter 30, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, there may be no plague among them when you number them. This is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Shekel is 20 geras. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Everyone, including among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above, shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than a half a shekel. When you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves, and you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourself. They're being charged the same tax. And, you know, here's a list of some wealthy good guys from the Bible. Abraham and Job and Solomon, Joseph of Arimathea. I have a question mark next to Matthew. He was collecting taxes for the Romans. So what was he like before Jesus called him? Probably not the greatest of character. But the others, they were all quite wealthy. And... The, yeah, they had their flaws. Abraham certainly did. But God never said they were sinning or wrong or evil people for being wealthy. Now, this is from worldfoundations.com about what was happening in Jamestown and Plymouth. And it tells us first off the bat, the first English settlers in America landed in 1607 and called their settlement in the New World Jamestown. Headed by Captain John Smith, the colonists were economically organized as a socialistic community requiring all the settlers to give all products of their labor to the common store. Individuals had no property rights, no economic freedom. This system quickly turned disastrous, bringing famine and starvation. Said an early historian, it was premium for idleness and just suited the drones, who promptly decided that it was unnecessary to work themselves since others would work for them. So yeah, share the wealth. If I'm going to get a guaranteed income, universal basic or whatever you want to call it, why do I need to work? If As long as I'm getting enough money to pay my bills, there's no need to work. You're going to kill the work ethic. That's what happened at Jamestown. Even Smith's threats that if someone did not work, he would not eat, did little to improve the economic malaise. Thus, beginning in 1611, Governor Thomas Dale began abolishing the common store system. And four years later, he had the London Company grant 50 acres of land to each colonist if he would clear the trees and farm it. The injection of private property and econ economic freedom brought about a dramatic change in Jamestown. Now, the colonists worked and prospered. The new economic system demonstrated that socialism does not work. It also showed, as one observer has noted, that Christianity is not a socialistic uh, ch chimera. And intended to renew the customs of the world before changing the heart. And then a similar situation transpired in Massachusetts among the pilgrims. When they landed on the shores of Cape Cod Bay in 1620, so that's 13 years later, 
They set up the Plymouth Colony. They, like James, the Jamestown colonists, tried to equate Christianity with socialism. Their common store system failed, also failed. The colony was experiencing economic disaster. Something had to be done. The colony's governor, William Branford, like Governor Dale in Jamestown, assigned all able-bodied persons or families a portion of land as their own in 1623. Before long, the slothful and unproductive pilgrims turned from laggards and idle bodies to willing productive workers. Men who previously had feigned sickness were now eager to get into the fields. Even women went out to work eagerly. They now took their children with them and happily engaged in labor for their own family. The result was that the following harvest was a tremendous, bountiful harvest. So sharing the wealth uh, doesn't work from a standard economic uh, historical uh, standpoint. And I want to look also at a biblical example of what I'm talking about. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when he became king after his father died. We're told Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, and he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt, that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. Solomon, remember, built the temple. Temples cost money, especially when you're building a temple for the Most High God, and you've got to have the best of everything. He also fought a lot of wars. Wars also cost money. The governments don't have money, so where do they get it? Well, they get it from you and me, through taxes. Solomon instigated a lot of taxes on his people, and it became a burden. So he said to them, depart for three days and then come back to me. The people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, and he said, How do you advise me to answer these people? Okay, guys, give me your best advice. Well, what should I do here? They spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them, answer them, and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the, lo the yoke which your father put on us? So he went to the old man, the old guard, the guys who have lived life, have experiences, have seen things, and they told him what to do. And then he said, eh, I don't think so. Now that I understand getting advice from more than one uh, person more than one uh, school of thought. Okay, I understand covering all the... Okay, I get that. But look at his attitude. Rejected the advice and consulted his young men, uh, his frat buddies. The ones he grew up with, went to school with, played with. These are the young the young guns, the 20-something-year-olds, 30-something-year-olds uh, who really don't know what they're doing, but they've got all these theories. It's like when people... They, they, when some administrations pull people out of academia to staff their... Uh, administration who have all these theories, but they've never put them into practice. It's kind of what this is. Uh, so he's consulted the young men and asked, what advice do you give? The young men uh, who had grown up with him, his buddies, spoke to him saying, thus you should speak to this people who have spoken to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, okay, you ready for this? My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. Uh, to paraphrase a rock and roll song from the 70s, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, you think your taxes were high under my dad? You just wait. They're going to get higher. I'm going to raise your taxes. And that didn't work out too well. The kingdom split. Uh, Judah and Benjamin in the, uh, in the south and the ten northern tribes. And that was the last of them being a unified country with all the tribes together. So the idea of tax the rich ain't going to work. 
In fact, I ju it just occurred to me, about 10 years ago, one of the founders of Facebook left the United States and gave up his citizenship uh, because of the high taxes. And then the now majority leader of the United States Senate, Chuck Schumer, who was at the time just a rank and file senator, said, well, basically, I think he might have been the minority leader or the minority whip. Well, and I can't remember the, the Facebook founder's name, but he said, well, if he ever comes, he's basically going to have to pay all those back taxes. <laughs> Wait a minute. He left because the taxes are too high. How is telling him he's going to have to pay these, these huge back taxes going to be an incentive for him to come back? Lower the taxes. Okay? Tax more responsibly, spend more responsibly, and then see what happens. And then he says to advocate for the, going back to Dr. Dr. Lyons, advocate for the oppressed. Hey, not a problem. I'll advocate for the oppressed, for the really oppressed. Right now, it's June. It's Pride Month. The LBGTQ, well, whatever, gets a whole month to celebrate their sin. You had a, trans, a, a transgender, Dylan Mulvaney. He got an audience with the president. Doesn't sound too oppressed to me. But now... Uh, and this, uh, loving your enemies does not mean being complicit in their oppression of others. It means bringing them to the side of love where oppression ceases. Cool. How about this? Now, I have actually have this t-shirt, and I think the number changes over time. What about all the countries where Christianity is oppressed? North Korea. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s, there were only three known churches in North Korea. I don't know what, how many there are now. What about people like Riley Gaines who go to campuses to talk about uh, the concerns for real women when you've got uh, Leah, the Leah Thomases of the world coming into their locker room, their spaces, and competing in sports against them? And she's being told, basically, sit down and shut up. And she's been assaulted for expressing her views. Are you going to take up for her? Remember, we've got this little thing here called the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So, Mr. Lyon, you've got the same rights I do. A Muslim is free to practice their religion. An atheist is free to practice his. Okay, we're all free to do this. Well, as long as we don't mess with anybody else's rights, it's, we'll call it good. Which means I'm also free to question evolution. I'm free to question climate change. I am free to question COVID-19 and the protocols. I'm free to do all that. And there's not a thing in the world Congress or anybody else can do about it. Hate speech, that's just an, an attempt to get around the First Amendment. They're even where people are equating speech with violence. Speech is not violence. And we can't have honest discussion about anything if we can't uh, express our views. Hate speech is largely a subjective uh, uh, concept, which basically is just used to shut people down that uh, segments don't want to hear what they have to say. When Riley Gaines or uh, Charlie uh, Kirk or Michael Knowles or even myself or whoever shows up on a campus and speaks or at a church and speaks and all the protesters are you know, wanting them fired, we're going to dox them and get their information out there and we're going to have them fired from their jobs, hey, You've just admitted that your side is a loser when you do that. If you're so sure that your position is right, then you should have no problem with discussing it. Here are some countries where, uh, with uh, uh, restrictions of uh, re religious freedom. Down here in the white, there's low, moderate. Notice the United States is kind of moderate with restrictions on religion. We do have some. But look over here. I would really love to see somebody like a Dylan Mulvaney go to Saudi Arabia and speak his piece there. Or even go to Russia. I, my understanding is homosexuality is actually a criminal violation. I could be wrong on that. But go to one of these Muslim countries. You notice they never pick on the Muslim countries, uh, the LBGTQ or whatever. And, you know, Americans are supportive of free speech, as it should be. I am... Like Ivory Soap, I am 99, 44th, 100% free speech advocate. Uh, I have, will take up for a lot of people that I do not agree with, but they need to have the freedom to express their ideas, whether I like them or not. It doesn't matter. And then he says we need to beat our guns into plowshares. Well, this comes right out of Isaiah. The word of 
that Isaiah, the son of Amos, came concerning, uh, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, that it came to pass in the latter days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we shall walk in his path for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge the people between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now, this is what one writer called the third stage in the glorious future that it, it, this instruction will go out from Zion. Those who came to be instructed will carry the message to the rest of the world. These words from the latter part of verse 3 are inscribed in the ancient western wall of Jerusalem. The final stage is a state of peace in which people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. These words have achieved a more recent prominence because they are inscribed on a statue, a statue outside the United Nations headquarters of a blacksmith beating swords into plowshares. Now I'm suspecting Lines is probably a pro-gun control, anti-Second Amendment person. Uh, and there's some confusion with the Second Amendment because there is different versions of it with different capitalization, different punctuation. This version is the one that was used in the case of District of Columbia versus Heller, which once and for all established that the Second Amendment is an individual right, which shouldn't have been an argument anyway because the first ten amendments are individual rights, except for the Ninth and Tenth, which have got some um, uh, uh, rights reserved for the states. But a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear them shall not be infringed. And gun control advocates typically infringe on the rights of law-abiding citizens. And there is no biblical prohibition on Christians owning guns, on being soldiers or policemen. The one illustration we have uh, about soldiers and that sort of thing is when some soldiers came and wanted to be baptized by John the Baptist. And they said, uh, the soldiers came and asked John the baptizer, saying, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. That's it. That's all he said. He didn't say, get out. He didn't say, you have to become a conscientious objector. And I've had a, one or two discussions, not many over the years, with people, Christians, who went into battle and, and killed people. A uh, couple, uh, one of them was not a Christian at the time. They're both Vietnam veterans. The other one was a Christian, and it bothers them. And, uh, you know, the, I have never had to kill anybody. I don't really know how to relate to that. Uh, and it's a tough call to make. But there is no prohibition on us being soldiers or policemen or owning guns. It's just not there. So, once again, we look at progressive Christianity. It's not progressive. It's not Christian. It treats Christian. I don't even know why they call themselves Christians when they don't believe the Bible and they look at it as just myth and poetry. And how do you know how to follow Jesus if you reject the only record of him we have? Progressive Christianity is not biblical. Uh, it is not following the way of Jesus. It is creating a Jesus in their image rather than them accepting the fact they are created in God's image and are in the image of Christ. It is able, if you reject the Bible, call yourself a Christian, hey, I can have whatever I, whatever sin I want, I can make it whatever I want it to be, regardless of what the Bible says. So once again, we rebuke and debunk progressive Christianity. And if you're in a progressive Christian church, you need to get into your Bible, you need to study it, start asking questions. And tell me what you think. Leave your comments in the comment section below. Or you can send me your questions. You can leave your questions in the comment section below. 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com is my, is my email. I'll be glad to give you an answer. I can't guarantee you'll like my answer. I can't guarantee that uh, uh, I'll have one right away. Might have to take a little while to study it. I'll answer it in a my two cents worth, or maybe I'll do it in a sermon. It'll be up to me, all of my discretion, exactly how I answer your question. But that's going to wrap it up for this edition of My Two Cents Worth. Thank you for being here. Leave your comments in the comment section below. Remember to subscribe to the channel and to share these videos, comment on them, give them a thumbs up. We'll see you in the next video. I'm done and I am out. It's tea time.